um, the stakeholders, it will involve a legal entity, um, and it will involve a decision and revision process um, for the rules participation. There's no point in having rules if you cannot have some way of um, enforcing them or at least monitoring them. Um, however, there's no point in having rules if, if complying with the rules is so difficult that nobody actually wants to participate in it. So we have to make that balance very carefully. This version of the rules does not address a couple of things. It doesn't address the issues around how the rules themselves will be monitored, enforced, maintained, changed, evolved, etc. And it doesn't uh, concern itself with the legal basis for EOS. Those are being done. That work is being done elsewhere. Finally, for this section, um, a comment about the timing of the rules. Where, um, because EOSC is, because we're working to very tight timescales within EOSC, the rules of participation are being developed concurrently with other working groups which are defining what uh, things around fairness of data, defining the architecture for the um, EOSC, defining how EOSC will be sustainable, etc. And clearly the rules of participation need to incorporate elements from that work. So in the current version of the rules, there are some placeholders which refer to the outputs of that work, which will be filled in later as those other groups develop concepts that need to be incorporated into the rules. We use the term rules throughout. Um, it's not a perfect word, it means very many different things and in fact there's a broad range of different types of condition that are in the rules. Some of them might be considered terms and conditions of use, some of them might be considered acceptable use policies, etc. So the rules is an all-encompassing term that has many different levels within it. Um, one thing as I said we're not covering are legal regulations which will be looked at later in this process. So current status of the rules. Um, here, I'll go through um, the timeline that we're working to and then the actual rules. The first version of the rules um, were developed during last year and were reviewed by the EOSC Executive Board and Governing Board. Uh, in December of last year and the feedback we got from that was put into the version that's currently open, uh, version 02, which was put up on the EOS Secretariat website with a consultation uh, period that went between March and April of this year. And from that feedback, version 03 is currently being prepared which will then be opened again for further feedback from the community um, during the summer this year with a, and a further version to be developed by the end of the year with the stakeholders event uh, late this year as a clear milestone for further consultation. But today is also an opportunity uh, for consultation. So when we come onto the third part of the talk, you'll see there are several ways that we're gonna gather feedback from you uh, today and in the next few days. It's worth noting that the current rules are very deliberately as short as we could possibly make them and our view here is that um, the final rules will also be very short and any issues that need discussion or commentary will be put in a, a separate place um, so each rule will have a paragraph or whatever is appropriate uh, discussing the issues that lie behind it but we want to keep the actual rule text as short as possible. Um, we're well aware that these rules need refinements. I've just gone through the process. We'll uh, go through for the rest of this year to do that. And that we're waiting um, for other working groups also to give their input to these rules. So if you want to have a look at the rules themselves, um, they're still available from download from the EOS Secretariat uh, website. If you go to the Rules of Participation webpage, you can see there the version of two of the rules is downloadable.
So now briefly to go through the rules themselves. There are four sections in the rules. Um, there's a section on some ground rules, some sort of overarching principles, if you like. There's a section on data, there's a section on services, and there's a section on uh, the operators, rules for the operators of EASC itself. So, firstly, looking at the ground rules, and this slide contains the full text of the rules, um, so I won't go through it all, but you see it is reasonably short. The first basic rule is that EOSC is open to all. The openness principle applies across all the resources, across all potential users, etc. However, of course, things can't be completely open all the time. Um, there are issues around privacy, etc. And those issues where we're not going for fully open, full openness, those issues will be delegated to the specific resources to make their own terms and conditions um, and we will the rules here just say that those terms and conditions must comply with the principles of openness defined in these rules participation. The second ground rule and this is perhaps a bit more of a definition than a rule it's saying that a resource is an EOS resource if and only if it's registered in an EOS recognized catalog of resources so if something becomes part of EOS when it registers as EOS uh, and it's of the ESC only if it's registered in a catalog. Notice we say a catalog, a recognized catalog of resources. There will be many of these. So there's a two tier system where centrally we recognize catalogs and those catalogs recognize resources. And as part of the registration, we um, will, this will be the point at which resources have to indicate their compliance with the rules of participation as well as any onboarding requirements for those particular uh, systems <clears throat> that's covered further later finally we put and this is probably sorry finally we put and this is probably for enforcement later and probably isn't the case right now the use got use of eos branding is available to the registered resources so at some point in the future we will say that you can only call yourself part of the EOSC if you are, have gone through that registration process. At the moment, we're in a sort of um, very open state where the uh, use of the term is, is rather relaxed. Moving on to data, we have six rules of data, and these are almost mirrored in the rules for services. There are just the slight differences between rules for data and rules for services. The first one is about uh, resources being free of charge for data resources. The policy here is quite clear. Um, if it's public, this public sector uh, funding that has gone, public funding that has gone into the collection of the data, then that data should be made open. And however, you can see, and I won't go into the details, there are four little caveats on this. Um, as you can imagine, this can be quite complicated and we'll discuss this later perhaps. Um, data producers will adhere to principles of proper research conduct. I think that's uh, fairly obvious. As I said, in D3, we capture the idea that of subsidiarity, um, where uh, data providers will determine the use, terms of use for those data resources that they provide but again, within some overarching principles that are set out centrally in these rules of participation. Data providers will respect the principles of fair data, and this is where we uh, defer to the fair working group to give us more details. So you see the first bullet under uh, D4 says that data providers will implement the fair principles as defined by the fair working group. So here, we either put a link to their outputs or uh, bring in some outputs from that group. We also make a placeholder in D5 to say that those who do provide data um, can impose uh, terms of use on the users of that data. So data users will adhere to the terms of use of the data resources as those are defined by the, by the data providers and they are not willfully violate any of those terms of use. 
And again, another sort of general principle that the data users will reference the source of their data. And there's some caveats there about where possible, because as data gets used and reused and reused in a sort of hierarchical way, the traceability to the original data might be quite difficult to follow. Hopefully in the fullness of time, we will have automated systems that can track provenance of data, which will help with this. Moving on to services, um, as you can see, these rules sort of mirror the data rules that we structured it in this way um, because there are some conditions which are slightly different for services. Again, services exposed through EOS are free of charge at the point of access, very similar to the one for data. However, the sub points here are slightly different. Service providers adhere to the principles of proper research conduct, of course. Service providers determine and publish the conditions of the use of their services, very similar to data, but the actual detail might be slightly different. Here, whereas the data uh, resources adhere to the principles of fair data set out by the fair working group, the service providers will adhere to the EOSC service architecture as defined by the architecture of the group. And then S5 and S6, similar to D5 and D6, um, are there saying that users of the services uh, will comply with the terms of use of the service they consume and they will reference the services they consume. As I said, the detail points in the sub bullets I won't go into, but clearly here the uh, way this is done is slightly different than it is with data. The final section of the rules is about the operators. So these are those systems that make EOSC itself work. And here we have to be more stringent than we do for those resources that are offered on a sort of voluntary basis, um, which make the content of EOSC valuable, but where if any individual resource disappeared, um, it wouldn't bring down the whole system. So the operators of, of, of EOS that are the, sometimes called the core um, are the federating core. Those are the systems which keep EOS alive and working. Um, and here the rules are more stringent. Um, however, we imagine that the system that these providers of these resources will be compensated directly for their providing it under some sorts of contractual arrangements. Here we say. It, well, there will be a registry of data and service catalogues. This is so that you can register with a catalog as we put in the um, overarching uh, global rules. Um, that system has to be uh, reliable, etc. The operators will deploy processes so that you can register your resource and so that you can onboard it and go through any um, uh, conditions that might be required in that onboarding process. There'll be monitoring and accounting systems so that uh, we can see what usage is made of EOSC. This will be essential to ensure that the emphasis is put in the right places in further development. There'll be a system for authentication and authorization. There'll be a global search function and other, fun and other global functions across the whole of EOSC. Um, my personal view is that the, the global search function will be just one of many ways of searching EOSC. I think there'll be field specific or domain specific ways in as well, where the portal that you go uh, through will be tailored to the work that you're likely to be doing within your field domain. There will also be a global system for going in. And the core will also offer APIs um, so, uh, so that uh, service providers can build on top of the core resources in EOSC um, and add value and uh, make innovative steps, etc., by building on top of the things. And in order to do that, the features of EOSC have to be available not only through user interfaces but also through programmable interfaces. So uh, that's what I wanted to say by way of introduction. I think we have uh, about half an hour left for discussion. So here I will hand over to Dale, uh, who will take us through the discussion part of the session.
Thank you, Dale. And as I said, I can't seem to see the chat at the moment. So if there is anything going on in the chat, <laughs> please let someone, please let me know. Over to you, Dale. Thank you, Juan. Good morning, everybody. And it's nice to be with you, even if it's virtually rather than face to face in Karlsruhe, as we had all been expecting. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, please, Juan. So um, our aim in this section of the, the session is to um, both give you some insight into some of the feedback that we've actually received during the consultation on the, the draft, uh, so version 0 0.2, which Juan has just run through. That's the version that was put out for public consultation and we've collected and analysed um, the feedback that we've received. So this next section will we'll give you some feedback on the feedback. Um, I'll tell you some of the key points that came out uh, that, that we received from people. Um, but it's also intended um, as an opportunity for you to um, give us your comments on the information actually. So it's a means for us to collect further feedback and input and suggestions and views and so on from you. So um, some, some logistics. Um, first thing, we're not planning to use Slido in this session. So that's one less thing for you to worry about. Um, what we're proposing is that we ask people to raise their hand um, if you want to speak. And we use the Zoom chat um, for posting your comments and questions. So please just go ahead and do that. Um, you can see that there is also a Google Doc, um, which I'll share the link for in a moment in the chat. Um, and the idea is that um, similar to what was done in Budapest, if you, if you attended that session, we had a document where we were able to um, collect um, comments over several days and that was very successful and quite valuable actually so it gives us a slightly longer lasting record um, so we were hoping to be able to do the same thing um, today with that so I'll, I'll put the link in just now in the chat um, but just bear in mind that I probably can't both monitor a Google document and Zoom chat comments so for the purposes of the session now please put your comments into the Zoom chat and that's what I'll be monitoring to try to see what people say. Okay, um, if you can move to the next slide, please. Dale, well, there is one hand up at the moment, uh, Mario David. Ah, yes, I see that. Mario, Mario. You want something? So you Hello. can unmute. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is about authentication and authorization, uh, saying that you allow uh, basically federated uh, academic uh, users. This is okay. Uh, the point is, uh, even in, in EOS, there will be services and data which will be accessed by non-academic users. So uh, the question is about, uh, one of the questions is about that. The second question is, is if you consider uh, for both the services and data repositories any type of quality assurance uh, for those services to be included uh, in the OSC portal. So I can answer both of those by saying those issues are delegated to other groups. Um, so the authentication and, and um, authorization is uh, being done by a task force under the architecture working group. So um, we it's not really a, an issue for the rules, it's um, so much as a, a technical issue that will be developed by them. So we wait to see what they do. Um, and the second question was about um, extending any, that. Go on. Any type of, uh, if you will include any type of quality issues right. on yeah. the services. So this is um, mostly delegated through the different research infrastructures that will be uh, federated in EOSC. So the type of quality assurance and et cetera will be done by the separate systems, compliant with overarching quality principles that we put in these rules. So these rules will contain overarching principles about quality and reliability, but then when resources get onboarded into EOSC through one of the subsidiary, uh, one, through one of the federated infrastructures, 
and they will go through an onboarding process where those things are enforced. So there are some high level things in these rules about quality, but the detail will be worked out in the uh, individual uh, resources that with the infrastructures that federate together. Okay, um, I hope that answered your question. Uh, let's move on to Mayo. Okay, so um, for the purposes of, of just going through these um, issues that came out in the consultation, we've grouped them um, into four different sections, status, scope, substance and structure. So if you could move on to the next slide, please, Juan. We'll get straight into the issues around what we've called status. So the first point that came out was what should be the overall level, so to speak, of the rules of participation? Um, should they be principles or should they be actual rules? Um, the point was made that if they are principles at the relatively high level, then actually the consequence of that may be that there are considerable efforts required between communities to jointly interpret um, what the rules are and, and how they should be applied. Um, on the other hand, there was also feedback saying that um, the rules really should be applicable at a practical level and there should be a means of validation. So in terms of applicability, a suggestion was made that the actual rules themselves could be in the form of models or frameworks, um, which would then allow some flexibility um, for them to be applied to different resource types, for example. In terms of validation, um, the um, point came up about, well, okay, What's, what are the consequences of breaking the rules then? And of course, that, that then takes you into the territory of monitoring and penalties and enforcement, um, which the rules currently don't say anything about. So I think it would be very interesting to, to hear some input or questions from you, um, comments and views in these sorts of areas to try to gather some more input from you um, to find out what, what in general the, the consensus, if any, might be um, in these, about these sorts of aspects. Um, also, in this um, cluster of, of pieces of feedback, um, what should be the priority in case of divergence? I thought there was a very interesting question that was raised. Um, so, should the terms and conditions of a particular community take precedence over the principles stated in the rules of participation, for example, if um, there is a case where they turn out to be different? Okay, so, um, what we'd like to encourage is for you to make any comments or pose any questions you'd like um, around these. Um, that's a summary of the, the strongest um, pieces of feedback that I think came back in this section that we've called status, um, about the general sort of level of them and so on. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm watching the Zoom chat to see if anything comes in. I'll just give you a little moment to say anything if you would like to. You can also raise so, your hands if you prefer. Yeah, just to note, Dola, I have managed to get to see the Zoom chat and the raise hands window now, so I can answer okay. that for you. Thanks. Okay, whilst you're thinking, I will move on to the next slide um, and just give you a summary of the feedback on that section. But please do just keep, keep thinking. We're happy to take questions and comments from you on, on any of these aspects. So the next um, cluster of pieces of feedback we've grouped under the heading of scope of the rules. Um, the rules which one ran through, um, they currently talk about digital resources and about data and services. Um, that raises the question about other types of resource such as software and training which are not specifically addressed in the draft at the moment. So what should the rules be? Um, are they the same? Um, what are the distinctions? Um, I'll break off there because I see see that a question has been put in into the chat and it refers more to the points on the previous slides. So rather than keep going with this slide, I'll, I'll take this question. So Yin Chen has asked, what drives the evolution of the change of the rules? Which I think is a, a very good point actually that is raised indeed by, by several of the points of feedback that we uh, received. Um, 
the the draft that we consulted on made the assumption that the rules would be um, owned essentially they would the responsibility for the rules would be that of the EOSC legal entity um, and although nothing was explicitly said in this current draft um, I think it has to be the case that whoever owns the rules will have to in the, in the future be responsible for their their evolution and their periodic review based on experience or their updating as as the landscape changes over time um, so i think the the evolution would need to be driven by um, by experience by feedback by input and i think the the processes around that and the communication to support it would would all need to be developed by um, the the entity which is responsible which becomes responsible for um, the rules in the future once they're actually adopted and implemented so thank you for your question. Um, I'll continue going through the scope slide. Um, the second point here was, um, the point was raised about the whether the issue of ethics and research integrity should be mentioned in the ROP. So should the ROP actually con contain a statement relating to um, the, um, the ambition of the EOS? in the area of ethics and research integrity um, or is this something that, that really is covered or should be covered in a more general sense somewhere outside of the ROP so where's the appropriate place to cover that type of that type of thing um, another issue that came up um, which we had varying feedback about was the section about EOSC operators so essentially the the those entities which provide the functions in the EOSC core or what's sometimes called the core um, do they or don't they belong as a section in the ROP and there was not a consensus in the feedback that we received um, about this some people felt that um, yes the rules for operators should belong in the ROP because that way users and providers of the ROP would be able to see what the conditions were that were being um, required Required of the operators. On the other hand, I think there, there was an opinion that said that really these, these sorts of rules should sit elsewhere and were not necessarily part of the ROP. And if there was a desire, um, as there probably is, for people to know um, what the terms and conditions are that apply to the operators, that information can be communicated elsewhere but outside of the ROP. Finally, on this slide, um, what research services are included in the EOSC and so subject to the rules. So this, this is really about commercial services. So um, in terms of convenience for researchers, it would obviously be convenient if all the possible services that they might um, wish to discover or be able to use, including commercial services, could all be findable in one place. But of course, commercial services often are, or tools are often in response, in. Um, return for payment. So it raises the question of whether it's um, appropriate or viable or possible for the ROP to be applied to commercial services. Um, would they need to have their own separate set of ROP? Um, what's the, the viable or appropriate solution um, for that particular category of services? And I think there's a balance there really between um, convenience for researchers and the application of the principles of the, of the EOSC itself. Um, so quite a big area there, I think. Um, and I think your, your input would be very interesting. I'll pause there for breath. Um, just looking at the chat. What to do if the rules are broken, the, says Luciano Guido. The ultimate step is to revoke the possibility of using the EOS branding. But the main issue oops, is how the main issue is how to deal with the process in between. In other words, how to manage the interaction with the rule breakers in order to keep them on board if possible. Yes, and I suppose that gets into both monitoring so you know if the rules are being broken anyway what are the processes around that um, and then yes as you say perhaps some sort of mediation process or discussion with the rule breakers to to try to keep them on board yes it's a good point thank you just add briefly that one of the sort of approaches we like to take with this is to make the process as transparent as possible 
so that feedback on the services, feedback on, on uh, anybody using EOS can be done in the open and that there'd be a, a degree of community monitoring of systems and operators to see what's going on and maybe just the need, the, 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 the fact that um, comments will be made in the open might be a way of a first stage in trying to encourage people to stick to the rules. But as you're quite right that there will need to be another process behind that to take up with things don't work properly. Okay, thank you. And I see that Per has raised his hand. So Per, I've unmuted you if you would like to speak. Oh, yeah. Hello. Did Hi. You hear me? Hello, hello. Hello, Dale and Juan. Good to see you. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> uh, uh, so now I was thinking the, this question around the um, the rules for the providers there. I <clears throat> I would assume that they probably have a, a part of it here, but the, especially for, for the uh, providers, it should be held on a very general level because um, and and keep open because when when uh, say the providers here. And including providers into the EOSC, uh, when that hits reality, one need to be open and to the fact that providers comes from many different, um, the very, several different conditions here, and uh, the actual rules will be set in uh, service level agreements, other type of agreements between maybe if the uh, legal entity have a specific agreement with a provider or a, a service is provided uh, by uh, the change of policy of a uh, government that or a funder that they allow that resources they are funding uh, are actually become available also for general European researchers use and so on instead of only on a national level. And uh, I think one have to be put the rules here in a very general level to allow for this very different, I, I would expect very different ways of that services and various type of data resources and other services will come in open, be open for that to come in. So I, for example, this rule on monitoring and accounting, uh, yes, but one can't to whom should monitoring and accounting be provided? Where, when is this important? When is it possible? And why is it important? Uh, that is not fully clear until you have a real agreement on how the service is provided. So uh, yes. I would be I would be careful to be too detailed in these rules, but but keep them on a general level. What are so to say kind of barrier that need to be, and then there will be more detailed SLAs and so on for various services. Yes, um, I think I can agree completely. Um, we try to stay fairly abstract in these rules. We will have a place for commentary about issues and explanation of what goes behind the rule. So, for example, um, where things are delegated to the individual resources or infrastructures, then those things can be pointed to in that country. With respect to monitoring and accounting, um, I think it's clear that the usage will have to be monitored when added up so that we can see what's happening. Um, my personal view is that those metrics would be open um, just because we follow the principle of as open as possible and I don't see why usage metrics should not be open. And then that is a baseline for any other agreements elsewhere around compensation. Um, I mean, one thing we have to recognize is that all the different lines of funding that will go in to uh, support different resources on, that are available through EOSC those will all have their own governance, their own rules, their own uh, ways of monitoring and, and compensating and their own feedback systems, et cetera, and review systems. 
So these rules that we're writing here do not replace those. They sit alongside whatever governance is in place for the funding of the resources that are going in to us. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm conscious there, there are some really good questions coming in in the chat, but I'm conscious that we're getting quite short of time. So I think we may need to move on now. Um, and if I just remind you that we've got the Google document where we can capture um, these points and, and perhaps have some, some more discussion over the next few days on them. Um, so, um, if you can move to the next slides, uh, Juan, please. I think we, we probably need to keep moving. So the, the third set of uh, feedback points is grouped under the heading of the substance of the rules. Um, so um, several points relating to the, the point about the EOSC that it should be, that services should be free at the point of use. Um, the question was actually raised about whether this principle should belong in the rules at all, in fact. Um, partly in relation to the fact that actually compensation is provided through many different mechanisms. So it's a very complex area. And of course, ultimately, nothing is free. It's all got to be paid for somehow, somewhere, just perhaps not at the point of use. So um, one of the, the points that was made was that you may well, for example, have free discovery of a resource, but then um, the use of the, the resource um, has costs applied to it. Um, as long as those costs are transparently communicated, is that acceptable? Um, and a question was also raised actually about, um, well, what about compensation for the cost of data use? So not, not just focusing only on the cost of service use, but what about the cost of data use? So there's a whole cluster of, of points that came up in this area, not surprisingly, since it's a very large, complicated area. Um, there was also feedback relating to acknowledgement of use of resources, which of course there, there is some proposed um, content about in the draft rules. Um, the point was made that users really won't always know which resources, particularly which services they've actually made use of. So they will not always potentially be in a position to, to be able to make acknowledgement. Um, but the question was also raised about whether um, a standard citation scheme was possible. And I think that relates to the fact that um, in broader terms, incentives and rewards within research organisations will take time to um, be, be modernised, if you like, so that the, the motivation of users in particular to um, move to um, citation of use of services, for example, is, is potentially going to be somewhat low for some time. So is it possible actually to implement um, a standard citation scheme? Um, and also, um, quality assurance, so there was, there was a point about this earlier on. Um, this did come up, um, so there's, there's nothing in the draft rules at the moment about this, but um, in terms of quality assurance of the available resources, a suggestion was made that perhaps what would be workable would be to have quality assessment of the fairness of outputs produced through or provided by the EOSC. Um, so um, allowing people actually simply to, to judge for themselves, essentially, but based on information provided. Um, and that, of course, comes back again to the issue of monitoring. So what should be monitored? Um, when, how, and indeed by whom, actually, as well. So there's a whole, a whole pot of different questions there. Um, right, I've not been looking at the chat during the last moment. So are there any questions relating to any of that that we need to pick up? I see a comment from Joy Davidson, data should be findable but free at point of access is in some cases very costly. Yes, exactly. I think that was recognised in some of the feedback we, we received. Um, oh, in Appleton, FAIR is by no means the only measure of quality assessment. It fits poorly for many services. Right, thank you. Okay. And what wow, I see you've replied to that. Okay, I'm running a bit behind hand with keeping up with the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to reply, but uh, <laughs> it's difficult to do everything at once. But yeah. I think you yeah. could move on. Okay, so if you move to the next slide, then please. Okay, so finally, um, relating to the structure of the rules, um, the current draft structured um, 
the rules along the lines of resource types, so data services. There was, there was some feedback um, to the effect that it might be easier if the rules were structured by the type of actor, such as users, providers, and so on. Um, so it would be interesting to hear some more views on um, which you feel might be preferable, or indeed actually, could each rule stand independently from the others anyway? So if each rule um, had its own explanatory text, then essentially you would release yourself from the ability to actually choose definitively which structure to use. Um, a rule could, could either refer to actors or resources or indeed something else, um, as was necessary. And uh, would that actually be a, a, a more successful way of structuring the rules? So your further feedback on these points, I think would be very helpful actually, because it's, it's quite a thorny issue actually, trying to figure out exactly how to structure these rules in the most successful manner. I see we've got a vote for type, uh, structuring along type of resources as is currently the case. Thank you, Luciano. And Owen Appleton says there needs to be a hierarchy of rules, starting with general ones, then move down to um, a structure by type of actor, so users, providers, and so on, and then by type of activity, so provision of a service, provision of data. Yes, thank you. I think I think this structured approach is very interesting and, and probably has some good potential actually. Um, if there's any other comments on that, I think that would be very interesting because it's a, um, I think it's a, 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 an approach that has some good potential which we should look at. Um, yes, and you've you've got a schema of that sort as a as a proposal that could be looked at. Thank you. I think that's yeah. potentially very valuable. Yes, thanks. So, in uh, I've looked at that schema and we'll bring it up in a working group meeting in the future. Um, I think it's worth commenting on Sophie Servan's. Um, comment about the process uh, going forward from here. Um, yes, it's a very good point. We got feedback from a good number of um, EOS projects, I think probably getting close to 20, um, but that's not all the projects. And it's quite possible that within those projects, we feedback was only given by a small group of um, people. So it, it is difficult to know how, whether we have really collected uh, feedback widely enough. Um, it's fair to say that even from the feedback we have got, um, there's also already an awful lot of very interesting points made and some contradictory points made. So um, we clearly have uh, some balance to strike. There are checks and balances all over this, and there are many places where we have to find the right balance, and it's difficult to know where that is. So I think, you know, arguments. Um, anybody's free to put forward comments at, at any time and in the next few days, especially that Google documents. If you want to make specific points about where the balance should be in some of these issues, um, please do so. Um, of course, in the end, we have to kind of make decisions um, based on uh, all the feedback received and we can't necessarily uh, satisfy what everybody's suggestions. But clearly we haven't received feedback from as wide as possible yet, um, but we already have uh, a lot of feedback with many different views. So we're already in a position which is quite difficult to satisfy everybody. So, yeah. But if you do have suggestions about the process going forward, please put those in the Google document as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I see some, there's some very good comments coming and actually there's a, a point from Rene Belso about um, relating to the free at the point of access. What's the business model? Yes, it, it, indeed. I think that's a very good question that you've made, uh, Rene. Um, you may have also noticed though that Rob has pointed out that we are very short of time now before we'll all get moved back into the main session. So I think we, we may need to wrap up there. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for the for the comments, for your interaction. Um, please keep it coming using the Google document. Um, and uh, obviously all the points that are made, we will, we will do our best to take them on board um, in drafting the next draft of the ROP. Can I just check with you? Rob that the comments from the chat will be preserved for us as well? Yes, that's right. We will save okay. the chat. 
Okay. So thank you. Maybe you could put those at the end of the Google document so that we've got everything in one place. Okay. In that case, uh, I think we'll have to draw this session to a close so that people can get a coffee uh, before the start of the next session. Um, thank you all very much. I hope it was useful. Hope you understand uh, the challenges we have and, uh, um, and please try and help us by making suggestions um, on these rather difficult issues that uh, exist in this area. So thank you very much. And I think we can all return to the main session now.